like it or if you want to watch it back afterwards. Um, and at the bottom of the screen, you will also see a Q&A functionality um, at any point during the event, uh, during any of the talks or um, in the keynote presentation, please don't be shy in sharing any questions that you may have and we will get through as many of them as we can. Um, so quick intro from me. Um, my name is Catherine and I will be your host today. Um, so I am head of marketing at a brilliant brand called Inshore based in sunny Brighton. We're one of the fastest growing inshore techs um, live in the UK, Europe and New York. A brilliant place to work and overall I've been in the marketing industry for about a decade now. Um, I love the variety and the excitement of a career in marketing and I'm sure many of you on the call feel exactly the same way so look forward to sharing that with you all. Um, so here's just a little bit more information about what Marketing Talk is all about. So like I mentioned at the beginning, this is just all about helping marketers from all backgrounds, all industries and all levels to upskill and develop. This is the second event that we've done now. Um, and it's all about helping other marketers and, our, and us as hosts to fill our toolkits with the personal and professional skills that we need to thrive. So part of that will be regular events with brilliant speakers like the two that we've got lined up today. And in the future, we hope to also run breakout sessions uh, where you can share a campaign or a problem or whatever it is that you're working on that you want to bounce around with your peers on the call. Everyone here is also invited to speak. Um, this is really the start of a marketing community. So particularly if you haven't turned your hand to public speaking yet, and it's something that you want to give a go, this is a safe place for you to do so. You are very welcome to come and give a talk, whether that is a 10 minute power talk or a 45 minute keynote like we'll have today. If that's something that you would be interested in doing, please get in touch with me or anyone from Silicon Brighton on LinkedIn, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Um, so just to cover off today's agenda, so we'll hear a bit more from Steve Rackley at Silicon Brighton shortly, then we'll get into our talk. So we've got a brilliant keynote lined up from Phil Agnew from Bramwatch, who's gonna to talk to us about the stuff they don't teach you in marketing school followed by a fireside chat with Steve Linney, who has recently founded his own business um, and that came about during lockdown. So it should be a really inspiring and hopefully insightful Q&A for anyone who's thinking about doing the same thing. And then we'll wrap up with a bit more info about our next event so that you can save the date as well as how to get more involved with the community. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Steve Rackley from Silicon Brighton, um, the team who helped to make this possible today. Over to you, Steve, to tell us a bit more about Silicon Brighton. Thank you. Hey, Catherine. Hi. Thanks everyone for joining us. I think we might play a quick video before we start. Oh, here we go. Uh, hi, uh, thanks Catherine and, uh, and hi everyone. Uh, as uh, Catherine uh, graciously introed me, my name is uh, Steve Rackley and I am one of the founders of Silicon Brighton. For any of you new to us, our mission is to drive tech growth in Brighton and, uh, and we address that in a, in a couple of ways. Uh, firstly, by hosting and promoting events 
uh, where attendees leave with knowledge and skills gained and connections made to help them drive both their businesses and careers forward. And secondly, and most importantly, uh, by both highlighting the value of communities and facilitating their adoption. Now it's this second point I'm gonna focus just a little with you on today. Uh, every day we hear the word community used, but what does it really mean? There are many definitions out there for community, but the one that most closely defines the way we use it is a group of like-minded people who make us feel uplifted, encouraged, inspired, and supported. A true sense of belonging can come when we make the conscious decision to join a community that's right for us. But why is that? Well, having a community is having a support network. One of the biggest obstacles we face in our career paths is lack of support. It's support and encouragement that we really need in order to move forward. Communities are also a safe space to have conversations, share knowledge, and can foster collective creativity and innovation. Theodore Zeldin, an English scholar said, Conversa conversation is a meeting of minds with different memories and habits. When minds meet, they don't just exchange facts, they transform them, reshape them, draw different implications from them, engage in new trains of thought. Conversation doesn't just reshuffle the cards, it creates new cards. Now he knew what he was talking about. Communities made up of like-minded individuals can be a safe space to share and build upon knowledge and experience. In fact, many of us feel a deeper sense of satisfaction and more passion and commitment towards an idea when we're able to connect with people who have similar backgrounds. Communities offer valuable networking opportunities. Some people feel a sense of discomfort when they act about the act of networking. They think for small talk with, with complete strangers, but networking doesn't have to take place at an awkward networking event. Networking is simply the act of communicating with people. Networking inside your community can help you build relationships, develop your current career, and even stay up to date on trends. And finally, it's an opportunity for authentic mentoring relationships. The right mentor can empower you to open new doors, enable you to focus on your goals, and help you realize your capabilities regardless of the challenges you foresee. On the other hand, having the opportunity to mentor someone can help re-energize your career, strengthen your skills and broaden your experience. It is not surprising that some of the most influential people in today's world tie their success back to a strong mentoring relationship. Many of you here today could just be attending for the speakers Catherine has lined up, and I absolutely wouldn't blame you at all. Phil and Steve are top draw. But if any of you are keen to connect further, join a support network, grow your skill set, grow your relationships, then I implore you to join the Marketing Talk community. Catherine will share some details later, later on today, uh, but in case any of you can't stay until two, then visit siliconbrighton.com and from there you can access our brand new community hub. Now this wasn't due to be released for another few weeks but we've sped up development to provide you all today with a way to connect together. Now from there you can access marketing talk by selecting meetup groups and from that point you will all be able to reach out to together. You'll be able to start forum discussions, you'll be able to ask for advice, you can share knowledge, and there's a really cool projects area where you can request others to collaborate on ideas. Now, I must say again, you will all be the first to use the platform. Please do provide any feedback you can, uh, but we feel very confident it will give you all the tools, all the tools you need so you can connect. And going back to our original community definition, so you can feel uplifted, encouraged, inspired, and supported. 
Okay, I will leave you now. Uh, thank you all so much for listening and joining today. Uh, if anyone watching is keen to explore further how they can contribute to Silicon Brighton, then please reach out. We'll include our contact details in the follow-up to this event today. And I hope you very much enjoy the talks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Very inspiring stuff. So I'd like to now introduce our keynote speaker, Phil, who's going to be sharing some fascinating insights from the world of consumer psychology and leave you with some really actionable tips that you can start using right away to help make your marketing even more effective. As a reminder, don't be shy with the Q&A at, uh, at the bottom, sorry. Add your questions as we go and we've got plenty of time to go through them all at the end. Uh, over to you, Phil. Thank you. Thanks very much, Catherine. My name is Phil Agnew. I am, let me just share my screens, Director of Product Marketing at Brownwatch, a large Brighton-based private tech company that does social listening. We're one of the leaders in this space. So I've spent many a year at Brownwatch understanding how marketing works and how tech and marketing collaborate. And I'm also host of Nudge, the only podcast dedicated to consumer psychology, which is a top 10 marketing podcast in the UK and delves and tries to understand the science behind how consumers make decisions. Now I'm going to start off by showing you something that I got from my time at university and my marketing degree. It is a huge bit of debt. So I saw in the chat beforehand, a lot of you are at university at the moment, you will be very aware that marketing degrees cost an awful lot of money. And you would think that this money, that this investment in yourself would leave you in a brilliant position when you start your marketing career. You would imagine that when you go into your first marketing role, that you'd be really effective and really successful. But that wasn't the case for me. When I graduated and went into my first role in marketing, I really struggled. There was a big disconnect between some of the lofty ideas and frameworks and strategy I was taught at university and then some of the actual tactical things I needed to do in my everyday marketing role. I didn't know how to create a good web page. I didn't know how to design good positioning. I didn't know how to correctly price a product. And I don't think I'm alone. I think there are a lot of marketers that struggle with this. And the reason I think that is because of two stats. One is from Recruit and Marketing. They did a study in 2018, which asked marketers how much of their budget is wasted. Marketers said, one fourth, 25% of their budget is wasted. It's useless. It goes to waste. One fourth of everything they do gathers no ROI. That's a huge amount of inefficiency. And take a look at this from HBR. 80% of new product launches fail. The vast majority of new things that we bring to market as marketers don't achieve their goals. There's clearly a big problem with marketers being able to get success and repeatedly generate ROI in their roles. And if you ask marketers, if I asked everybody on this call or everybody in my team or the marketing community why this is, you get heaps of different excuses and heaps of different responses. I've asked this question to, to loads of marketers and I've heard everything from, you know, we don't always have enough budget to we don't have the right people in our team to, you know, I've just got a bit of a shitty boss. That's why you get a lot of different bits of feedback. And it's really difficult to understand why in marketing there is so much inefficiency and why as an early marketer starting my first marketing role, I struggled to be efficient and effective in my role. But I think there is a common theme that draws all of these together. And I think it's to do with, with basically this. A lot of marketing decisions, a lot of the decisions we make as marketers are based on gut instinct. In fact, according to a study by Forbes, that researched how marketers make decisions, they found that the vast majority, over 50% of major, major decisions in marketing. So what's our next campaign going to be around? Who, which influencer are we going to use for our campaign? Um, how will my paid strategy be organized? Major decisions like that, over 50% are based on gut instinct. As marketers, we don't tend to rely on science, we don't tend to rely on rules, and we don't tend to rely on laws. And that's a real shame, because if you look at professions that have an extremely high level of efficiency, that don't um, have 25% of their work going to waste, people like lawyers, people like teachers, people like doctors, 
you find that they based the majority of their decisions, that the majority of their studies are based around science, around laws, around data. Wouldn't it be great if us marketers had a reliable law book, a reliable law, rule book we could follow that would mean our marketing is far more effective that would mean people like me getting into my first marketing job wouldn't struggle so much. Instead, us marketers were a bit like madmen, we're a bit like those people from the 60s, still basing over 50% of our decisions on gut instinct. But what if marketers had laws? And the thing is, we sort of do. When I was getting to grips with my first role in marketing, I started to discover little things, little laws, little rules that I could follow that would make me more effective. And all of these rules tended to stem from one place, an understanding of consumers and an understanding specifically of how consumers' brains work and how they made decisions. By looking at that, I started to uncover all these different and interesting ways um, that successful marketing works. And I discovered that there is heaps and heaps of information about how consumers make decisions. We have spent hundreds of years analyzing it. And a few of the first things I saw really inspired me and I'll share them with you today. So one of the first things I was made aware of upon starting my marketing career was something called social proof. Now social proof, a lot of you will have heard of. It is the idea that we follow the actions of others. If you are walking down the street and you see a dozen or so pedestrians looking into a shop window, you will look into that shop window as well. You can't help it. You follow the actions of others. But this can be used as a sort of marketing rule or law that can help you dramatically improve your marketing. So Richard Shotton, a brilliant sort of marketing expert and part-time consumer psychologist who wrote a fantastic book called The Choice Factory, he went into his local London pub and asked the barman, what is your best selling beer? The barman said it was London Pride or, or whatever it was. Let's say it was London Pride. And Richard asked the barman if he would mind trialing something for a week. Specifically, he asked to put a label on top of that beer saying this beer is best selling. Now, you wouldn't think that should change the amount of sales the pub makes. In fact, it shouldn't change anything at all. It's just stating the obvious that there is one best selling beer. But that's not the case. People are driven by social proof. We want to follow the actions of others. So if we see that other people are buying a drink that perhaps you haven't tried before, you might be more inclined to buy it. In fact, week on week sales, when Richard added this logo, went up by 2.5 times for that beer. That beer suddenly was selling even more simply because Richard said that other people were buying it. And what's interesting is sales of the other beer didn't go down, just general revenue for the pub went up. This was amazing for me to learn that just simply by stating what other people are doing can really influence decisions and influence our consumers was really inspiring for me as a marketer. But it's not the only thing I sort of got my hands on when I was first starting out in my career. I learned about something called the endowment effect. Now, the endowment effect is um, essentially the idea that we are more likely to complete a task that has already begun. If something started, we're more likely to want to finish it. And this is highlighted in a brilliant study from 2006, which gave participants in the study loyalty cards for their local coffee shop. Now, one of the loyalty cards, the one on the left, was given to 50% of the participants. And in that, for that loyalty card, you needed to collect seven coffees, seven stamps by seven coffees, in order to get your eighth coffee for free. Now, the other card, you needed to collect nine stamps in order to get your tenth coffee for free. But the barista, when it was given to the other 50% of the participants, stamped in the first two stamps. Now, these cards are essentially the same. In both scenarios, you need to buy seven coffees in order to get one for free. But the one on the right had already had a bit of endowment. It had already begun. You'd already got something and started on your journey. And what was interesting is when researchers gave the card on the right to participants, they were 82% more likely to go back to the coffee shop seven times, buy seven more coffees and get the tenth for free. It was another tiny law that made me realize there is a bit of science behind how marketing works. There is a bit of science behind how consumers make decisions. And the final one I'll share, the final one I looked at before delving deeper was something called the practical effect. I love the practical effect. It's the idea that we love imperfection. We love things that aren't perfect. There's this brilliant study which looked at two people going through a job. And in the study, these two people were made to look completely identical. They were same demographic, same age, had the same skills, same experiences, same qualifications. And they went for the same or a similar job even. 
Um, and what they did is they interviewed and told them all about their strengths and their experiences. But one of the participants was told to say a weakness, to say, I don't know anything about SEO or I've got no idea how to write a blog. What was interesting is the participant that revealed it a weakness was more likely to get a job. We prefer imperfection. And a Polish chocolate spread company applied this to their marketing. They trialed two different versions of their advertising campaign. One where the chocolate spread is neatly spread across the toast and the other where it's just a bit imperfect. It's dolloped onto the toast. What they found was that the Prattful effect holds true. 63% of people who saw the messier version of the advertisement were more likely to purchase that chocolate spread afterwards. So I was a bit inspired by all of this work. I was inspired by understanding the science behind how consumers made decisions because it gave me some rules that I could follow as a marketer to improve in my job. Um, this is the sort of stuff I wish I'd learned in marketing school. I'm not going to at all blame marketing schools. There are a lot of these, a lot of schools do teach stuff like this much better than I will today. It's just the stuff that I wished I had learned. So I'm going to cover three specific areas and I'm going to start with distinctiveness on the left. Now distinctiveness is something almost all of you will know is important to marketing. If you are a distinct, if you are unique, you are more likely to stand out. This isn't a new thing. This was discovered way back in 1933 by a researcher called Hedwig von Resteroff, somebody with a very distinctive name, funnily enough. And what she did is she gave her participants long lists of strings of letters to remember. They were asked to read this list and then afterwards the list was removed and they were told to write down what they could remember. But within the list, she put a list of numbers and she wanted to see if the numbers, essentially the distinct thing, was more likely to be remembered. Turns out it is massively so. You are 30 times more likely to remember the list of numbers over the list of letters. Being distinct stands out. It's not an old wives tale, it's really science. And this has been replicated way in, in more modern terms and in marketing as well. So Richard Shotton, who I spoke of earlier, he gave participants a huge list of brands from a specific category. So let's say the automotive category, you know, BMW, Volkswagen, Volvo, all of these different brands. But within that list, he would put one brand from a distinctly different category. So Burger King from fast food, for example. What's interesting, when you have one distinct brand next to a lot of brands from the same industry, they stand out and they're more likely to be remembered, four times more likely to be remembered. Being distinct works. What's amazing though, is so many marketers don't realize this. If you look at the majority of marketing campaigns, you see competitors competing in the exact same spaces. Take football sponsorship for major tournaments, whereas the Carling Cup, Champions League, uh, FA, the majority of them have or are currently sponsored by literal lager, lager beverages companies. They all seem to sponsor in the same place. Take a look at the slogans and sponsors on the football players' shirts. They all tend to be gambling firms. Nine out of 20 of the Premier League clubs have gambling firms on their shirt. That number increases, I think, to 18 out of 24 of the championship clubs. There is a lot of copycat approach, and we know this sort of goes against science. And it's not just sponsorship in sort of gambling and football, it's elsewhere as well, in industries that we really admire. Take the SaaS tech industry. These are really highly paid, smart product marketers who know their stuff. And yet when you look at four different websites, they all tend to have copied a similar design. These are four very different websites from four very different companies, and yet they look identical. We really feel the need to copy competitors. We find it as being safe. And yet all of the science tells us that being distinct is better off. My favorite example, however, doesn't come from football, doesn't come from websites, it comes from the watch industry. These are three different companies with three different ads. They do look very similar though. They've each got Hollywood celebrity holding or wearing a watch. They look almost identical, similar coloring, similar styles. But that's not the thing that makes me laugh. The thing that makes me laugh is the time on the watch. Look at the time on the watch. They all set the time to the exact same time, eight minutes past 10. They're so desperate to copy one another. They're so desperate not to do anything risky that they even set their clocks to the same time. And you might say, well, this is obviously the case for these age old historic brands. You know, they're rooted in history and um, they're not going to be progressive and understanding of you know, how consumers are changing today. A high growth new company wouldn't fall foul of the same problem. Well, you'd be wrong. This is Apple's Apple Watch released. I think they did an update earlier this week. Exact same problem. 
clock set to eight minutes past 10. And it's a small thing, but it's significant or something because distinctiveness stands out. You should be working to add distinctiveness in your ads. And when you do, you can see real effects. So this is a study done with the Australian tax um, collectors. And what they were found, found is that Aussies weren't paying their taxes on time. The uh, Aussie tax collectors would send out these letters saying, please do pay your tax today, otherwise you're going to incur a fine. But they simply weren't being paid. And the researchers that were called in to help thought it might be to do with something to do with the letter. So the letter on the left-hand side of your screen is the one they were sending out, a normal, bland letter, white envelope. They thought this isn't distinct. Nobody's going to open this because it doesn't stand out in the sort of junk mail you, you might receive. So they trialed something. They trial doing something really simple, put a stamp on the letter in red, which says urgent, make it distinct. That slight change would have saved Australian citizens $4 million in late fees. They were far more likely to open the letter, far more likely to pay their tax on time. One tiny change with distinctiveness dramatically increased the effectiveness of that campaign. Another example comes from Copenhagen. Copenhagen had a problem with litter. Too many tourists were visiting and not putting their litter in the bin, meaning Copenhagen had to spend thousands of dollars on dustbin men and women. So what they did was make their bins distinct. Rather than paint them green and grey and let them blend into the background, they painted them neon and painted these neon footprints on the floor towards the bin. The result? 45% less rubbish on the street, 45% more rubbish in the bins. It saved the city thousands in taxpayers' money and a little sort of novel approach to distinctiveness works in a different scenario. But let's bring it back to marketing because that's what you're all here for. I'll give you a classic example of how marketing um, distinctiveness has worked in the UK. So 10 years ago, comparethemarket.com, which is a company that you would go to to get check different prices for different utility prices um, across the web, were really suffering. They couldn't get many much market share. They were fighting with competitors and no, no one was growing particularly well. And they were having a big problem in terms of standing out in their industry. And it's not a surprise because 10 years ago, everybody within the industry, whether it was comparethemarket.com, confuse.com, you switch, whoever it was, was doing very similar marketing. It was the type of marketing that we were taught to do in marketing school. They talked about their product benefits. We can give you a quote in seconds. They talked about how it will help the user. It's simple, it's fast, it's easy. They talked about how they beat their competitors. We save you more than competitor X. Problem was, they were all talking about the same thing. Nobody stood out, nobody was distinct. So compare the market, start try to do something different. They created, as you all know, Alexander the Meerkat, who had a site called comparethemeerkat.com, and in the adverts, he just complained about the fact that his website, comparethemeerkat.com, wasn't visited as much because it was being, all of their traffic was going to comparethemarket.com instead. It had gone were all of the references to the product benefits, gone were all of the references to how they're better than competitors. All they tried to do was to be distinct, and the effect was incredible. They had an 83% increase in awareness, a huge jump in market share, and achieved their 12-month objectives within nine weeks. And they're still using this campaign today. That, I think, is the biggest compliment you could pay to this campaign. It's clearly working because they're still using it today. But what's hilarious is they got such success out of this strategy, such success out of being distinct, that all of their competitors ended up copying them. They all started to do these random weird adverts with opera singers and builders dancing and all these different things. All the competitors went for the same tactic, completely ruining the point that Go Compare, were, um, Compare the Market were going for in the first place. So that's distinctiveness. Standing out improves recall. That is the Von Resteroff effect. But most brands want to copy competitors. They don't want to take risks. However, when you take risks, you can see huge results. Studies with tax collectors, bins and meerkats prove the success. Being distinct is actually less risky than copying your competitors and smarter. That is one of the first laws I learned and I'm so glad I've learned that law because it's helped me dramatically in my marketing career. Let's focus on the second one, anchoring. Now, anchoring is the idea that we are really influenced by the initial piece of information that we see. You know, if we're reading something and we sort of that sort of age old, age old adage, don't judge a book by its cover, well, we tend to, we always tend to be anchored by the initial piece of information we see. And this is hugely important for marketers to remember, because when you are trying to convince a consumer to purchase your goods, you have to be aware of some of the things that are anchoring them around that decision. 
So let's use an example to um, have a look at how anchoring affects decision making. This is a brilliant study. Um, and what they did in the study with the researchers is they gave participants a newspaper headline to analyze and to give their opinions on. So they were shown this newspaper headline, climate change bill to cost 100 million. Um, and they were asked, what are your thoughts on that headline? People gave their thoughts. Most people said, you know, this sounds like a smart idea. Climate change is an issue. Um, 100 million doesn't seem too much. All, all in all, it sounds positive. They would then ask a bunch of other questions, hundreds of other questions. So they kind of forgot about this one. Told to go away. The participants went away and came back in two weeks to get asked more questions. This time, they were shown the same headline, but with a different anchor. Instead of the Financial Times being the publisher of this head time, the headline, The Sun was the publisher of this headline. The same headline was the same. It said climate change bill to cost 100 million. And the same people were asked, what do you think? This time, they had a very different perception. Now they said 100 million is way too much. They said 100 million shouldn't be that much. You shouldn't have to pay that much for climate change. They said climate change in general isn't something we should be investing that much money for. The same people had a very different view of this headline depending on the anchor, depending on the initial piece of information that they saw. It's a hugely impactful thing that influences all of us in many of the decisions we make. And there's a great study, which I'll talk through now, which shows how a pretty inconsiderate, inconsistent and unimportant anchor can dramatically diff influence how much people bid on items. So Dan Ariely, a fantastic cognitive scientist in his book, Predictably Irrational, talked about this fantastic study he did with his students in MIT. He was in the States, so he asked his students to get out their social security card. The social security card has a random number on it. That number has nothing to do with your age, your gender, your tax bracket, nothing like that. So it's completely random. He said to the group to look at the last number on the card. Um, and he said, look and, look and see if it's a high number, so five to nine, or a low number, zero to four. So everyone with a high number go and sit on the left-hand side of his lecture hall, everyone with a low number, zero to four, go sit on the right-hand side. He grouped people based on the number. And he just said to them, remember the number, remember if you had a high number or a low number. He then brought out six different items to the front of the lecture hall, a couple of glasses of champagne, a keyboard, a mouse, a book. And he asked the students in an auction to bid on these items. He was looking to see if that random anchor, the anchor of seeing a high number on your social security card or a low number, would influence these bids. Would people spend two, three percent more if they had been anchored by a higher number? The results are fascinating. People didn't spend two or three percent more. They spent two or three times more. In some scenarios, like for the bottle of champagne, people with the lower numbers would spend in the social security would offer a bid of, say, $11 people with the higher numbers would offer a bid of up to $37. This random anchor seriously influenced us. And it's a hugely important thing to think about in your marketing. A great example of this applied to marketing was done in um, a brilliant book by Joseph Marks and Steve Martin released late last year. And what they did is they went into a real estate agent in the UK and they were looking at how the real estate agent operated and they discovered that the initial piece of information that potential buyers or sellers of house see and hear is the receptionist that picks up the phone. The receptionist that answers the phone and says, hi, this is X real estate agent, how can I help you today? They wanted to slightly tweak the message that that receptionist gave to the potential buyer to see if it had an effect on sales. They wanted to see if they could anchor the initial experience you would have with a company to see if it would have an effect on sales, because that's what the science says. So they asked the receptionist to change the sort of script they would read to read through. And instead of saying, hi, I'll pass you over to Peter, he can deal with your request. The receptionist would instead say, I'll pass you over to Peter. He has over 20 years of experience and would be perfect for you. They tweaked that based on who they were passing them over to, whether it was Peter or Paul or Pauline or whoever it was. But they would add a bit of anchoring, a bit of something extra to add value, saying he has 20 years of experience and would be perfect for you. They wanted to see if that anchor would change the ultimate decisions and follow-up decisions of the consumers, and it did. It had a massive effect. By adding that one little anchor to consumers who were going through the process of buying or selling with the real estate agents, they increased inquiries to valuations by 20% and actually went on to increase sales by 20% as well. 
we are hugely influenced by an anchor and it's such an important thing to remember as marketers. And it's not just real estate agents and classes in MIT, it works in marketing campaigns as well. And a great example of this is De Beers Diamond Wedding Ring. So in the 1930s, De Beers, which is a diamond company, had a problem. Only 10% of the engagement rings sold were diamond. The majority weren't. They were gold, they were silver, but they weren't diamond. And for a diamond company, this was a problem or perhaps an opportunity. They wanted to encourage people to buy more diamonds. The problem was people didn't spend enough on their engagement ring. They spent a week's salary or two weeks salary at most. They didn't spend anywhere near as en enough in order to justify buying a diamond wedding ring. So De Beers needed to do a marketing campaign that would encourage people to spend more. And they looked to anchoring for the answer. They created a marketing campaign, not dissimilar to the one on screen here. It says, how can you make two months salary last forever? It's a really significant anchor in there. They are saying, how can you make two of months of your salary far more than you are usually paying last forever? Well, you can do it by buying a diamond wedding ring. That anchor dramatically influenced consumers. Suddenly people were willing, maybe not to spend two months worth of their salary, but one month after seeing this campaign, they thought maybe that's the norm. And it hugely changed the amount of diamond wedding rings that people were willing to buy. In the USA, uh, the amount of diamond wedding rings went up from 10% to 80% in just 50 years. In Japan, much more recently, it's gone up from 5% to 77%. And the same thing is happening in China. And De Beers are using the exact same slogan, the exact same anchoring, anchoring campaign in each of these different markets. And they still use that campaign today. It's a 30, it was created in the 1930s and it's still being used today. And it's a sign of how strong the anchoring appeal can be. But I'll leave you with my favorite example of anchoring and it is from the late, great Steve Jobs. And this is from 2010 when Steve Jobs was introducing the iPad. And before the iPad was introduced, there was lots of speculation by journalists about how much this new piece of technology should cost. People had no idea. Some predicted it should cost no more than 150 or $200. After all, it's just a big version of an iPod Touch, which doesn't provide any additional value. Others guessed it might cost up to $1,000 though. They said, you know, there's a lot of tech going in to make this. This could cost a lot of money. But on average, the guesses came out at around $300. Most journalists agreed it shouldn't cost more than that. Steve Jobs, obviously being Steve Jobs, was reading all of this discussion online and spotted an opportunity to use an anchor. In his keynote presentation, after talking about how great the iPad is, all of the tech it has, all of the wonderful features it has, he put this figure on screen. He said, now some of you in the audience have predicted the iPad with all of its brilliant technology would cost $1,000, $999. Then he clicked his clicker and the $999 smashed into a hundred pieces and the real price of $499 appeared. He said, we've managed to get all of this brilliant tech, all of this brilliant functionality for half of the cost that some of you are predicting. We managed to get it down to $499. And the crowd genuinely went wild. The people who just days earlier were predicting it would cost $300, $250, $100 were now cheering at the fact it was costing $499. Anchoring seriously works. So consumers alter their decisions based on the anchor. Marketing campaigns and sales efficiency, as shown by De Beers and the real estate agents, improve when you use anchoring. Prices, like Steve Jobs' iPad, appear better value. You should find ways to anchor your message because it is one of the easiest ways to convince your consumers um, to make a decision. Before leaving you, I will leave you with scarcity. This is the smallest one, so not much more to listen to, but scarcity is another vital thing we need to be aware of. Now, most of you will know about scarcity. When the bell for last orders rings in the pub, you feel an urge to go and buy the final pint. Why? Because suddenly pints are a scarce resource. Suddenly you have a limited amount of time to buy. We value scarce resources highly. It dramatically influences how we make decisions. A great study which highlighted this was conducted back in 2000 by a researcher called Ian Inger. She created these booths within supermarkets that were selling varieties of jam. On alternative weekends in the States, she would have a booth which sold six varieties of jam and a booth which sold 24 varieties of jam. And she wanted to see which style of booth with more varieties or less varieties would encourage the most sales. 
Now, conventional marketing wisdom, what we might have been taught in marketing school, would surely tell us that the 24 variety version would be more successful. After all, it gives consumers the chance to pick a type of jam that they like, whether it's chili jam or strawberry jam or raspberry jam, they can find the one they want. You would assume the 24 variety version would get more sales, but it wasn't the case. 30% of consumers, when they saw the six variety booth, were likely to buy or did buy a jam, whereas only 3% of consumers who saw the 24 variety booth were likely to buy a jam. What's going on here? There's something around choice paralysis, there's something around seeing too many options makes you less likely to make a decision. There's also something about scarcity. Having fewer options, having less to choose for can actually make your product seem more appealing. And this has been proven in a number of different spaces. One of my favourites is in um, movie posters and asking people if they're likely to go see a movie. Um, so in one study they asked a bunch of consumers how likely are you to go and see the latest movie and consumers on average said, I don't know, let's say two out of ten were said they were likely to see the movie. And then they slightly changed the message for a second group of participants. They said, how likely are you to go and see this movie? By the way, here's the end date. Here's when it stops premiering. And incredibly, when they said that, when they said when it was ending, whether it was this weekend or the next, people were 36% more likely to attend. That's a huge, huge impact, a huge marketing opportunity. And yet today, there's still no signs on movie posters saying when the movie will stop premiering, a huge opportunity missed. There is so much as marketers can learn from the world of consumer psychology. But it's not just in marketing that we see scarcity taking effect, it's with ourselves and our lives as well. When we get to an age like 29, 39, 49, according to Dan Pink in his book, When, we start to think about the scarcity of our lives. We start to think how many years we've got less left, how few or perhaps how little years we have left. There's something about being a nine ender, having an age ending in nine, that makes us think our life is scarce. And that means our decisions dramatically change. If you look at marathon sign-up data, we are far more likely to run a marathon when we have an age ending in 29, 39 or 49. If you look at data from Ashley Madison's uh, an extramarital affairs website, you'll find that people are far more likely to cheat on their partner when they have this age. And if you look at death certificates, unfortunately, you'll find that people are far more likely to commit suicide when you're aged 29, 39 or 49. Scarcity dramatically changes how we look at the world and some of the decisions we make. But I'll leave you with a classic marketing example, one that I think just shows how important it is to understand the psychology behind consumers. It's a study which was done in a US supermarket and what they did, I think it was in Iowa, and they, they put up big slogans across the supermarket saying, please, or just buy some Campbell's soup. They put those up and they found that people bought three cans of soup. How fantastic is that? Marketing works. Put up a big slogan saying, buy soup, people buy soup. Quite a lot of soup, three varieties. And then they decided, let's tweak this. Let's add a little bit of scarcity in here to see if it changes the amount people buy. They put buy soup, asterisk, sales limited to 12 cans per person. Now what is hilarious about this is nobody was buying 12 cans before, nobody was even tempted to go out and buy 12 cans. But the researchers thought maybe this little bit of scarcity will change the amount people buy. It shouldn't work, it shouldn't be successful, but people are a bit irrational. And when they saw that message, they actually bought on average four and a half cans of soup. We are heavily influenced by scarcity and it's a vital thing I wish I'd learnt about in marketing school. So scarce resources are valued higher. Uh, behaviour shifts when scarcity is known, so make sure you let your customers know about scarcity. It can be one of the simplest ways to improve your marketing messaging. If you're hosting a webinar or an event, talk about the amount of seats you have left, the limited number that's available, um, and you can use scarcity to influence behaviour, whether it's buying soup, whether it's encouraging people to go to the movie or whether it's people buying jam that is the power of scarcity so that's all i've got time for today i've probably overrun a little anyway but those are three things that i wish i had learned more about in marketing school i'm so happy i've kept with me um, if you are interested in any of the things i've talked about today if you'd like to know more about these sorts of studies these findings these bits of laws and knowledge that you can apply to your marketing do check out my podcast. On Nudge, I speak to people smarter than myself, real experts in the field about the psychology behind how consumers make decisions. And in the shows, we really give marketers loads of insight and analysis into how you can improve your everyday work with a bit, little bit of consumer psychology. So if you want to learn more, go and check out the podcast. Anyway, that is all I've got time for today. Thank you for listening. And I'd be very excited and happy to answer any questions you've put in the chat. 
Thank you so much, Phil. That was absolutely fantastic. I learned loads and my brain is definitely ticking over at the moment thinking about all the ways that I'm going to go away and uh, use those principles. I think my favourite was the time on the watch. That is absolutely hilarious. Mm. <laughs> um, and also seeing even the likes of Steve Jobs using these principles. If it's good enough for Steve Jobs, it's definitely good enough for me. Um, lots of questions coming through, uh, which is fantastic to see. So we'll get started on those now. And please do use the Q&A button at the bottom to either ask a question that you might have about the talk or to upvote one that you also would have asked. So let's go in order of upvoting. So the most popular question so far has been, if a brand is an innovator, like com uh, compare the market in the example that you gave, should they move on when they start getting copied by the competition to remain innovative or should they stick with their successful approach? It's a really, really good question and one that I, I have thought about a lot because you see it really often. EasyJet's another example. They went to market with a very distinct colour and branding. You know, nobody was painting their planes orange. If you mm -hmm. look at airplanes across the globe now so many planes have copied that approach the number one cheap flight operator in i think australia has the exact same um, brand of orange so it's really co really common if you find success in this that people will copy you and the important thing to remember here is we're not the science doesn't tell people to be differentiated it doesn't say you have to be different to your competitors at all costs it just says you have to be distinct you have to stand out in the consumer's mind so compare the market are able to continue to use that marketing campaign because it is still so distinct in our mind. It really stands out for us. We remember it, we recall it, it works. There's no point in them changing that right now because it still stands out. If there gets to a point where so many people have copied them and in fact, so many people are doing such similar things, maybe with really similar anim animorphic characters that are talking, that's the stage where they might think about changing. But for now, people, it is still distinct, it still stands out, there's no point in changing it. So remember, it's about this, this dis distinction, how much do I stand out in the consumer's mind rather than differentiation? So it's not to do, let's just change as soon as our competitors vaguely copy our strategy. Mm -hmm. so, and it's also about sort of building that long-term recall, isn't it? Rather than sort of tactically moving on to all of these principles and um, yeah, maintaining that sort of brand integrity. Absolutely. Great. A um, couple of questions for you career-wise, actually, that I'll dive into. Um, so has it been difficult for you to progress with your career within one organisation? The person who submitted this question has said that they've often been told that they need to move to advance and they're pleased to see someone who's managed to do that differently and actually move, it, move up within their own organisation. So can you talk to your experience of that a little bit? That's such a great question. And yeah, I think it depends massively on the type of organisation you're at. So I was really privileged and am privileged to work at an organisation that has a culture of letting people, maybe from graduate roles or from younger positions, progress if they sort of have the talent and ambition to do so. Um, so I found a real place at Brownwatch and I'm continuing to use Brownwatch because I think it's a brilliant place to work and they really value that. But not every company is like that. I think the best piece of advice I heard about career progression, and it was from the head of product marketing at Facebook, he said that what you have to be aware of within your career is momentum. There's the feeling you get when you have momentum, whether it's uh, constant sort of praise from senior people within your company, little promotions or jumps or a career path that you know you're progressing on. You know when you don't have momentum as well, that feeling that you're just doing the exact same stuff you were doing six months ago and you're not learning anything new. As soon as you start to feel that that momentum is going, as soon as you start to feel stagnant, that's when you need to, as a sort of individual, start to look for different opportunities. I would always encourage you to do that first within house and let your manager and your peers know that's what you want to do. And if it's not possible within your company, then maybe it's time to look elsewhere. But it's about checking for momentum, feeling that you're growing and, and learning within your organization, and then taking it on yourself to get that momentum if it's not within your company, either by asking people internally or looking externally. Mm, fantastic advice. Um, yeah, within our careers, particularly when we're first getting started, it's so important to sort of be your own champion and um, you know, just strive for those opportunities. And I actually think that a lot of the tactics that you shared today could be really helpful for marketers who want to put themselves in the spotlight, come up with new and innovative ideas, you know, despite how effective a lot of the things that you've talked about today are, they're probably relatively unknown in many organisations. So 
I would challenge everyone on the call today to take the plunge and recommend one of these and start testing and, and see what comes of it because it could be a brilliant way to start uh, seeing some progression happening. Uh, right, okay, lots of questions coming through, so let me just take a look at them. A um, couple more careers, career type ones, which we've probably covered. Um, so looking at product marketing in the UK industry as a whole, um, its difficulties nowadays, challenges and future developments. What are the important approaches that you take for product marketing campaigns specifically? And you know what might be quite helpful actually is, I was having this conversation with someone in my team yesterday, how would you define product marketing and what makes it different from something like brand marketing, for example? Mm, great question. So how would I define product marketing? Product marketing, um, there are two core parts to product marketing that you maybe wouldn't get in brand marketing. So the first core part of product marketing is bringing a product to market. So understanding what benefits of the product are, understanding what its differentiators are, hearing and talking to your peers in the R&D part of the organization and really telling a story about how the feature they have built will help your market. So it requires a great understanding of your product and a great understanding of your market. And that might be a little bit similar to a brand role. The difference is the second part of product marketing, which is bringing the market back to the product. So you have a huge important part of your role, which is interviewing and listening and chatting with your customers, with your prospects, jumping on sales calls, jumping on customer councils with your clients, learning and hearing from them and bringing that information back to your product team educating your R&D team to make sure that they are building products that are right for your market. So that sort of yin and yang, that to and fro between product and market really makes the product marketing role um, unique. In terms of sort of where product marketing is heading, it's a huge growth um, role within the UK. Um, I would encourage everybody if they're interested in product marketing to go check out the Product Marketing Alliance. They're a really good group, open group of product marketers. There's about 11,000 of us in there um, run by a great group of people they create fantastic content on how to get into product marketing they've got a brilliant slack community with job boards with all of the latest jobs in product marketing um, and their piece of content which is called the state of product marketing talks about how product marketing roles are growing hugely year on year i think they're doubling in the uk so they're becoming really um, significant and i would definitely advise you to go check out um, their content if you're interested in finding out more about the community and I'd really encourage you to do that because I really like product marketing I think it's a it's a brilliant role to be in. Great that's really helpful thank you. Uh, great question coming from Amy thank you for your question so I'll read this out for you. I work as the sole marketer in a company that's quite small and can be stuck in their ways. I would love to apply some of the principles that you have talked about to our marketing but I don't find there's a huge amount of scope to do something new do you have any suggestions on easing their apprehension as to trying something new with our marketing? Oh, so exciting, Amy. I'm so glad you asked that question because it's it can be terrifying when you're a sole marketer trying to you know make your case and plant your fat flag. But it's also a really exciting time because you know you have the capacity to make decisions that could really shape your organisation. Um, it is difficult though, and so what I would encourage you to do if you are looking at applying some of these principles is you can't just sort of go in one day and say, you know, I want to do a campaign with meerkats because I think it will work. There's so many steps you've got to do before that. And the one I always encourage is trying to build a bit of a vocabulary between you and your peers around some of the stuff you're trying to work on. So if you are interested in adding distinctiveness or building a campaign around distinctiveness or anchoring or scarcity, start off by sharing some of the things that we've talked about today by going and doing a bit of your own research and getting some studies together putting some studies together that show that this sort of stuff can be effective in other fields that will start to build a vocab that will start to get people thinking okay there is this thing called scarcity we can try to start to use it and then the next step i think is rather than just building a complete campaign and going with it is trying to do some sort of test so us marketers are brilliant at this because we do a b testing all the time but Essentially, any type of A-B test or RCT, randomly controlled test, is perfect for this. See if you can do this type of messaging for a specific region or on a specific day or um, test it with your audience with one style of email versus another and just see what sort of data you get back. If the data is good, if the numbers are good, and if you've already built that sort of understanding of the principle internally, you'll find it's much easier to get pushed through. But it'll, it'll be important to build up that level of understanding and sort of vocabulary um, to start with, otherwise people might just not understand why you're trying to push through certain initiatives and tactics. 
Great advice, thank you. And probably also worth noting that we are recording this session and Phil, very helpfully, I noticed that you quoted all of your sources at the bottom of your um, slides for every principle. So that's a great starting point to go out and get your hands on those books or um, articles that will help to give you that backing for going ahead with these principles as well. Brilliant. Um, question come in from Luke, which I was thinking about while you were talking, actually. Um, to what extent do you think we will see scarcity being used a lot more? Because it was definitely seen to a high degree during lockdown when supermarkets were limiting purchases, like the soup example. So do you think that's something that other brands will start to pick up on now and potentially use in the future? Great question. Great question. Um, just before I answer the question, just because we referenced um, books, if people mm. do want that full list, just ping me a tweet on at p, p underscore agnew or find me on LinkedIn and Phil Agnew. I've got a full list I can say, which has got all of those sources on them. In terms of scarcity, I think some people ask that question. Some people ask the complete opposite. They say, isn't scarcity overused? Isn't, you know, booking.com and all these sites, real estate, um, e-commerce sites, they always use scarcity. And I swear it's overused at the moment. So it's difficult to find the, the in-between. What I've found really interesting looking at the most recent studies coming out of the field of consumer psychology is that scarcity is still hugely effective. It doesn't seem to be um, you know, having less of an effect on people because it's been overused during the coronavirus period or anything like that. It still seems to be a very easy and clear way to convince your consumers. There is an amazing study done by KFC in Australia. They had a, a really simple proposition they were bringing to market. They wanted to just get people to buy their chips for a dollar. That was it. That's the proposition. That's all they wanted to do. Chips for a dollar from KFC. But the marketing wizards at KFC were really keen on finding the best message they could put alongside this offer. What is the most creative, smartest, brilliant marketing slogan we can come up with to convince people to buy it? So they, their copywriters and marketers, this whole team, including an agency, got together to write 70 different slogans that they could create, 70 different things they could come up with to try and convince people to buy it. They put those 70 different marketing slogans onto Facebook ads in Australia and tested out all of the 70. So this huge trial to see what would be most successful. There were super creative things in there, super smart things, all sorts of different messages. But the message that was most successful, that got, I think, three times more clicks, engagement and purchases off the back of it was just classic scarcity. All it said was buy chips for a dollar limited to three pa packs of chips per customer classic scarcity even beats out some of the most creative slogans people can come up with so i think as a marketer definitely expect it to be used more i think that's one of the things that's put in the question but also you might have to do some convincing with people that this still works you know just because booking.com have got it in every part of their site and you know if you buy a flight today you have to go through sort of multiple scarcity hoops this stuff still works so it's still proven to be hugely impactful and you would be really silly to disregard it. Great to know, love that example. Uh, we still have questions coming in, but we have gone slightly over, so I think we'll have to leave it there, but um, I cannot recommend Phil's podcast Nudge enough. I'm a long time listener myself. There's a ton of episodes that cover these principles and more. The most recent one is about uh, whether swearing is good for you, which I particularly enjoy. Um, so please do check that out and it sounds like Phil would be open if you want to pop him a message on LinkedIn or, or Twitter if you've got a burning question that you still want to ask. I'm sure he'd be very happy to uh, have a chat with you. And absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much, Phil. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Cheers. Thank you. All right. So now we move on to our fireside chat with another fabulous speaker. So I'm delighted to introduce everyone to Steve Linney who's here to talk to us today about his experience of actually starting his own business in lockdown and turning something that was a sort of personal passion project into a full-time business. Welcome, Steve, and thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for having me today. It's been good to kind of come on board. Yeah, brilliant. So do you want to get started? And again, um, please do use the Q&A button at the bottom, everyone. Um, I've got some questions that we're going to talk through, but we should have some time in the end to go through any extra as well, so don't be shy. Um, Steve, do you want to start by just telling us a little bit more about yourself and your career journey leading up to this point? 
Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, so it's probably been 20 years that I've been working in marketing in kind of one form or another. And that's kind of ranged from uh, back in the day doing kind of promoting nightclubs and uh, running a record label um, and then kind of progressed over the years through to running in-house teams as a head of marketing as well, which is kind of what brought me down to Brighton. Uh, it must be about nine years ago now. Great. And where did the idea for your business wavelength design come from and how long did the idea sort of percolate before you took the plunge oh yeah so that, essentially I've, I've been wanting to do my own thing for the last few years but i've never really had that kind of eureka moment where i can kind of match what i want to do and kind of make some money out of it which is kind of the important part of it so Hopefully I found that with Wavelength Design, which is a binaural beat and meditation app. And so with Wavelength Design, what I've done is I've combined my kind of skills and interests, which um, includes music, meditation, video production and marketing, and trying to really kind of meld them into something that we can create a product that isn't just for me, you know, it's for kind of uh, consumers as well, uh, but it's something that I can really get passionate about as well and kind of give it my all essentially and um, I suppose kind of lose my I, at the start of lockdown I kind of I was working full-time somewhere else and um, but I lost that job and it's you know the problem was there wasn't a lot of jobs kicking about as well and there wasn't a lot of interest well I didn't have much interest in the jobs that were around so in some uh, to some extent I've been my hands been forced to kind of go down this line but I think that's a good thing as well you know that kind of bit of um uncomfortableness you know that kind of fear of the unknown to a certain extent has kind of helped drive on you know I've got a plan in mind um, but you know I'm, I'm kind of trying to be agile with what I do with it as well just try and um, make sure I'm going down a path that um, is um, right for me but also kind of right for the business as well so um, yeah so that's kind of involving kind of a, a lot of leaps into the unknown but I think it's kind of making me a, a happier person and it's going to make me better at what I do in terms of marketing and in terms of delivering a product as well. So hopefully that will bring some nice positive results over the next few years. Great. It's really inspiring to kind of hear you speak quite openly about, you know, losing your job, which I think probably there's some people on the call who would have been affected. Many, many people all over the world have been affected mm. obviously by the situation that we've been in. So to hear that you kind of took that as an opportunity to, to take a risk and, and start your own thing is, is really inspiring. I think what would be really helpful is if you can talk through some of the challenges that you faced in, in getting the business set up and how you came to overcome them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, first of all, the idea is the main challenge. You know, it's, um, it's one thing to know you want to do your own thing, but it's also a much bigger thing to have something that people can kind of get on board with as well, you know, so you're not just um, turning it into a vanity project, you know, which is kind of going to waste a lot of time, waste money and all that side of things as well. So um, to solve this, um, what I did was I used a ton of post-it notes and anyone who's worked with me over the years will know that I love a post-it note. Um, so essentially, I just kind of made a massive mind map, which um, in one section had my skills, I had my interests, and then I had kind of professional goals. So it's kind of a triangle or a pyramid, although not a pyramid scheme, I have to say. Um, I just tried to find a combination that kind of worked as well. You know, again, it's going back to that thing that I can be passionate about, and but also it's having something that is genuinely of use that I can give out to the, the world, so to speak. And then, you know, people want to kind of get on board with that. And then kind of the next challenge with being locked down was um, time and childcare. You know, my wife is kind of working full time as well. And I was kind of looking after my two boys who are two and five, which are kind of a handful of trouble, um, but fantastic at the same time. But what it, meant, what it meant when it came to the business, I kind of had to be, you know, have an agile project management approach to things. And I run everything through asana.com which I've done for years as well you know but just as much as a personal project still treat it as if you're kind of working for someone else and you know essentially you know at the moment I'm working for the mortgage <laughs> that's kind of the boss just now you know so trying to make sure you're doing things as professionally as, as what you can do because you don't want to let things slide essentially um, yeah and it's all about kind of using your time as effectively as what you can do you know, concentrate on what's the most important job over the one that kind of excites me the most 
Um, and the last few months has it's been about getting the foundations in place and get them as firm as what they can do. You know, there's a lot of kind of back end stuff of the website which I, I hate doing. You know, I'm not a developer, but um, it's 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 stuff that's, that has to get done. You know, so and. I suppose in some sense it's kind of looking at the way that you can do things as well just now so for example I'm, I'm running on a WordPress website it's not ideal further down the line but it kind of it works for now and it kind of works in terms of budget and kind of what I can do as well um, yeah so try not to do everything at once as well is a big thing um, you know you've got to be crucial or be crucial with your time and the money that you have to hand, you know, you're still um, best to concentrate in one area and kind of really own it. And by that, um, I suppose I'm probably talking about inbound marketing in the main. So my main focus at the moment is going to be on Facebook, uh, backed up with uh, my email marketing database. You know, there is other social channels that I'm going to do a light touch, but I just don't have the time to really kind of do them properly at the moment. But it's more about kind of bedding into those systems rather than kind of really owning them at the moment. Um, and yes, yeah, probably I suppose the main challenge has been the low budget and being self-funded, you know, again, which means going as niche as what we can do and, uh, you know, being as targeted with the audiences and trying to get as much A-B testing as, as what we can do. The difficulty we have with that, with A-B testing, you need a lot of traffic. We don't really have that just now. So is that thing where you're using your guts and I totally you know, agree that you shouldn't do that long term. I'm definitely um, in the camp as well where Marketing is a science as well as an art form, but um, unless you have numbers, you kind of have to go with your gut and hopefully 20 years of experience has made that a little bit easier, you know, but you still need to have freedom to fail and learn from the mistakes, but as well as you learn from your successes on that one. Um, so I think for me, for, for the, the, the app that we're doing is essentially, it's an online video app, um, video music app. And the biggest thing for me was trying to find a platform where I could run that on that wasn't going to cost an absolute arm and a leg. And I found that with Vimeo OTT, I kind of recommend it if anyone wants to kind of um, a paid subscription channel. It's been very straightforward, easy to use, and they kind of help handle the subscription payments as well. So. It means um, life is a little bit easier. It's by no means 100% perfect. For example, the payment page, you know, I look at it, I've, you know, I've got a lot of experience with optimization. It pains me that you can't optimize the payment page, but you know, it's kind of, instead of spending 40 grand up front, you know, I have this system that doesn't cost a lot of money. So you kind of got to do with what your budget can um, expand to essentially. And I suppose the final challenge I've got at the moment is, um, it's the one man band thing where I'm the product, you know, I'm the marketing team, I'm the sales team and I'm customer support, which is fine for now, but it's not sustainable and it's definitely an area that I'm going to kind of um, get support on as soon as what I can do. Great. So much insight there. I think one of the ones that I can definitely relate to is the idea of kind of doing the thing that you're most excited about and focusing all your time and energy there and um, the things that mm. are slightly more challenging to you almost sort of putting them on the back burner but you know when you go out on your own it's all your responsibility isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you had to give one top piece of advice to someone who was considering turning a side hustle or an idea that they've been playing around with into something more formal and full-time what would that be? Um, okay, well, one's going to be tough, but I'll, I'll keep it to a couple of ones because they all kind of uh, merge into each other. And to be honest, I've kind of, I suppose I've kind of touched on it as well, but I think the main thing is your passion. You know, find the passion. Um, find, find something you love and something you can be passionate about because passion is infectious and it's a tool to kind of hook people into your, your story. You know, um, you want people to kind of uh, love what you're doing and people buy from people, you know, so the more you can kind of get that, uh, passion out there and hopefully bring people back to it is going to be the, the best thing for that. Um, certainly don't rush too quickly into it as well. You've got to make sure it's something that is uh, genuinely of interest to other people. You know, think of it as the same way that you would look at a blog or a piece of video content. You know, you don't just chuck anything out there for the sake of it. You want to make sure it's going to do what it's meant to do, you know, and, and your, you know, side hustle is, is even more important because, you know, kind of money's on the table and all that side of things. Um, one thing I've been kind of lecturing um, CEOs over the last uh, two decades is not falling into the me, me, me trap, 
where they just like to talk about themselves. Um, I'm trying to make sure I don't do that as well, because <laughs> it is a very easy thing to do. You know, um, you know, you've got to just keep it as much as we can do on the benefits to the customer and not just your own story. But if you can merge those two together, that kind of makes, you know, that's kind of the golden nugget in many sense. Um, and I think, yeah, you know, kind of talking about that kind of st distinctiveness, I think it's definitely good to have a personality. You know, don't play it safe and straight down the line. Um, a bit of edge can go a long way, but you've got to make sure it kind of fits into your brand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I would quite like to jump in a bit more detail around some of the project management principles that you were just talking about, actually. Do you have an, a sort of a go-to framework or approach that you use when you're either brainstorming a new idea or trying to solve a problem what's your go-to approach um well the brainstorming again is kind of the post-it note session to be honest that's kind of a real good way to kind of um bring bring ideas out and if i kind of go back into my kind of past as well as a kind of a head of marketing that was always a good way as a team to kind of work together so you kind of um you got people to come up with ideas and just write one thing on the one word if you can in the post-it note and then take it up to the board and kind of talk through it. So it kind of gives people an opportunity to feel they're part of that process as well, you know? So um, it's, yeah, it's something that's kind of stuck with me over the time. But when it comes to project management sides as well, you know, I've got my kind of long-term goals, um, but I know chances are they're going to change over time, especially now, you know, we're kind of, you know, we're building the plane as we're flying the plane, but we don't quite know what the plane looks like fully um, at the moment we don't really know what the destination is we've just got an idea of where we want to go to so um it's trying to keep it in, like two weeks spurts or starts really you know and trying to be as agile you know it's an agile framework that i go to um you know just keep on top of it on a daily basis but having those kind of small micro goals that kind of go to the kind of the, the bigger macro goals kind of is the best way to do it really and but also just again you have to be agile to change where you have to don't limit yourself to opportunities that, that prop up you know uh, for example this talk wasn't in my uh, business plan you know last month but thankfully you guys said do you want to come on board and i said yes please so yeah i think that's kind of it really um being as yeah being as strict with yourself as you can be but also you've got to enjoy what you're doing so don't take the fun out of it too much yeah absolutely I think one thing that I would share at this point, actually, which is might be helpful to anyone who's in the situation, which is when you're trying to come up with an idea to either solve a problem or write copy or whatever it might be. If you're working on your own, one of the best things you can do is get an A4 piece of paper, mm. fold it in half and then fold it in half a couple more times. So you end up with six um, squares on the piece yeah. of paper, write down your first idea and then keep building on that idea in every square so that you don't settle for your first idea. You say, mm. right, hey, that was my idea. Now let's make it better. Okay, let's make it better again, or maybe in the process of actually come up with something else now. And mm. you're just pushing yourself. And I think when you're working on your own, um, I personally have been guilty of sort of coming up with an idea and just running with it, yeah. as opposed to really sort of questioning myself as to is this as, be as good as it possibly can be, or does it need a bit more refinement? Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And again, the well, data is a good one at that as well. You know, if the conversion rate's not there, <laughs> you know, you're, something's not right, you've got to fix it. So, but yeah, I, like the, I like that paper idea. Yeah, great. Um, so questions coming through on the Q&A, which is brilliant. So uh, the first one that came through, which is, how is your day-to-day -day life different now after becoming the founder of Wave, Wavelength Design after being a freelancer? Um, I, I suppose the difference is it's, it's it's your baby, it's your project that you're kind of working on, you know, so you don't, um, you, you've got a bit of freedom as well, you know, you can kind of go in different directions. Um, you know, I, I, I've personally been frustrated by um, some jobs in the past where you can, you can only go so far and all that sort of side of things. Um, but again, you kind of, it's that, you don't have that lack of discipline to some extent where you don't have people directly kind of waiting on you. you it's just essentially your own, um, I suppose your own discipline that you're going to have to work to as well. So it, it feels a lot more freedom, but again, because, you know, my oldest boy's gone back to school, but I'm still kind of looking after the youngest. It's kind of, it, no two days the same at the moment, you know, so it's kind of a, 
it's that kind of lockdown or well, post lockdown weird to new normal where you can't really predict exactly how things are going to be but again that's quite enjoyable and that, I suppose that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this as well where it's not um, the same old same day in day out. Yeah absolutely and thinking about you sort of being being on your own a question that, that's come out is how important is collaboration and when you are working on a project where you take on most of the work, work solo how do you decide when you need to bring in the help of others or when do you know that, that you can kind of solve it on your own? Yeah, um, so well, but the main answer is financially, you know, when I can afford to bring other people on boards because um, what, you know, I've got a good uh, network of um, talented musicians who have been making like house music for the last few years as well, who I know can do a really good job on um, doing some meditative stuff as well, you know, and I really want to kind of get that side of things on board as well so it's it's more it's yeah it's had, again it's going back to that kind of long-term plan of where i want to see myself and kind of bringing people into the mix on that side um and you know definitely the support side of things you know customer support side i'd like to bring someone in pretty quickly for that as well but um ideas wise is uh, you know i collaborate with my wife a lot as well you know we kind of knock ideas back together um friends as well i've got you know a lot of people that are kind of interested and the kind of meditation and music side of things that are kind of not in the business, so to speak, as well, you know, and it's, it's, it's just really finding, again, what resonates with other people, not just your own idea, because, you know, I can sell to myself all day, but I can't sell to someone who's not interested in what I do, so. Yeah, and for someone who's starting out who may be a student or early in their marketing career, uh, do you have any tips for how you start to go about building out your network of peers and people who you might want to work with in the future or designers or potential brands you might want to work for, for example? What's what's the best place to start to start building that network? Um, I think the best place to start is um, just be interested in other people and what people are doing, you know, and um, asking questions, uh, you know, and listening, not actually, actually listening to people about what they do as well, not just thinking about what you're going to say next is probably... You know, that was definitely a lesson I kind of learned. Um, you know, I, I remember back this years years ago when I was still a student and I was going for a job as a, an editor, you know, on a kind of local community project. And um, the whole time I just talked about myself, but I didn't ask any questions. And, you know, the guy was, he was really nice to say, look, you're, you know, you can come work for us, but next time ask me some questions <laughs> as well, you know. And so I was like, okay, okay. And so I just calmed myself down a bit. And just kind of showed a bit of interest in what other people are doing as well. But when it comes to networking as well, you know, I think don't don't force it as well. It's got to be in the right situation. And um, when I kind of first went freelance, I was going to different kind of curry meetups in Brighton, which is just full of uh, grey men and grey suits. And I was like, this is not the right place for me at all, you know. So that's why things like Silk and Brighton are fantastic for me because it's kind of like-minded people kind of doing similar sort of things as well. So it's again, finding your uh, community niche and, you know, kind of sticking with it and trying to, you know, get stuff from it, but also work out what you can give back to it as well. Cause it's a yin yang situation as well, you know, so, uh, you know, what you give, you get back essentially. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the growth in sort of virtual online events will probably help break down a few barriers for people as well. I, I personally, mm. nothing fills me with dread more than the idea of work, walking into a room for the people that you don't know and striking up conversations. So being able to do these things sort of virtually definitely helps as well. Yeah. Um, a question um, from someone who, um, probably more for your time when you were freelance, sounds like someone maybe working for an agency, um, mm. What's the best way to go about asking a client for more time, but still present yourself as being professional? Um, like again, it's having that kind of project plan in place because, uh, to be honest, it's, it needs to start from the beginning as well. You know, just to let people understand how long it takes to get a project going as well, and that, that includes in-house as well. You know. Um, I, when you have like a manager or a, an agency or you know you know a client or something like that doesn't understand the time scales involved that's where it gets difficult so it's about kind of clear communication but also um a clear understanding of what outcomes are going to be at the end of that as well you know and if you know things happen you know things things can fuck up um but it's just 
having that yeah a clear communication line and a good rapport with who you're kind of working with really makes it uh, easier if you kind of keep things to yourself and leave it to the last minute you're just kind of building up um issues that are going to kind of bite you later on down the line as well so and you know sometimes you just have to suck it up as well when someone doesn't really appreciate what you're saying to them but if you've done your best that, that you know you can then that's just it's just how it is yeah great advice there be honest be human Mm. Uh, great okay and um, just be conscious of time but a um, great question here which I think is probably the first thing that a lot of people might start thinking about when starting their own product or starting their own service how do you decide how much to charge someone for your time or for your product well do you know that's that's the age-old question as well and I've, I've had debates with that with uh, people work with <laughs> quite a lot and um, I went to SAS talk in Dublin a couple of years ago and essentially there was a whole, that's a whole day just people talking about how much they charge yeah. and invariably what you find out is people charge, they don't charge enough. Right. You know, so you spend a lot of time uh, working on the product and um, you're too scared to put the price up sometimes. Um, so, which is absolutely understandable as well, you know, so um, you don't want to lose custom for fear of what's down the line because you know what's coming in at the moment um, and but what i've tried to do just now is um again you know it's kind of there's an element of um you know kind of grass in the, in the wind sort of thing where you're just testing things out to begin with but you you need to understand what kind of quality products you have as well compared to your competitors and what your competitors are charging at you know so if you can if you've got something that's um as amazing as the next product over you can you know you can charge as much or even more than them as well because you know people don't buy into um, the price really they buy into the customer story you know and, and kind of um seth gordon's really kind of good at talking about this you know why do we buy um 100 pound uh, nike trainers when you know 30 pound trainers are just as good it's just because nike tell the story better than what other people do so um it's you know test it find out if it's if, if it's you know you don't want to go mad and start putting prices up all the time but um you know particularly if you're doing uh, subscription based models you can at least grandfather people when they're on that kind of level for a while but um you know it's just treat your customers with respect and hopefully they'll kind of um appreciate that and want to stick with you as well lovely Thank you so much, Steve. If um, people who are watching want to find out more about what you're doing at Wavelength Design, where should they go? Um, well, it's wavelength.design is the uh, domain, so that's the best place to check out. Um, and um, you can find obviously on LinkedIn as well, it'd be a really good place on Twitter, is at Steve Linney. Um, and I can't, oh, this is a terrible thing. The Twitter for Wavelength account is wavelengthdhq, but um, yeah, we're not really concentrating on that too much. <laughs> thank you so much. Time is definitely the way forward. Uh, well, thank you so so much. And I'm sure um, if there's any questions that I haven't had the chance to go through, I'm sure Steve would be very happy if you want to drop him a line on LinkedIn or maybe not Twitter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, add Steve Lenny for Twitter, it would be okay. <laughs> uh, that was brilliant. Thank you so much for your time, Steve. Oh, thank That's you. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been good to, good to be part of it. Great stuff. All right then, so that brings our second edition of Marketing Talk to a close. Thank you so, so much everyone who has attended and for all your brilliant questions. Um, I've certainly learnt a lot and I hope you have too. Um, please, if you have enjoyed today's session, I would love to hear from you or if you think um, something could have been better or a topic that you would like to hear from, um, in the future, don't hesitate to drop me or anyone from Silicon Brighton a line. Um, we also have some info on our next event. Um, if we can get that up on the screen, I've got, there we go. Um, so there's two QR codes here. One is for our next event, which is on the 30th of October. We're already lining up some brilliant talks um, for that event. If you did wanna talk, Again, please don't hesitate to get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. It doesn't need to be a long session. It could be something really short if you want to get that first experience. So please do get in touch. Uh, the second piece um, there, which is the Marketing Talk community, that's the fantastic Silicon Brighton hub that Steve Rackley told us about earlier. He gave me a behind the scenes tour of it a couple of days ago and it looks really, really good. It's a place where you can set up a profile, 
connect with others who have come to the event today or in the world of marketing, um, share campaigns, share insights, share links, pose questions if you're struggling with something. We'd really love for that to become a place where marketers from all levels and all backgrounds can come and um, meet like-minded people basically and, and get answers to the questions that, that might be bugging you in your campaign. So please do um, zap that QR code if you are able to right now. I'm sure there will also be a follow-up email to everyone who came today so that you can get the info for that after the talk. And in fact, um, the link has just gone up in the chat there, I think, as well, if you wanted to register for the next event. Uh, again, thank you so, so much, everyone, for coming. I hope that you have enjoyed it as much as we have and hopefully see you next time. Thank you so much. <laughs>